good. Okay, my name is Rachel Scheinerman. I'm the editor of My Jewish Learning, and I'm so excited to welcome you all to an event. We're partnering with the Jewish Book Council here, and I'm going to introduce my um, co-partner there in a minute. Um, but we're so excited to... Oh, Yep, we're so excited to welcome you all to celebrate um, this list and discuss this list of 120 books for every age that we published this summer. We have four of the authors with us today. Um, and I was asked to tell you how it came about. So uh, it came about because the Washington Post actually um, published a list of 100 books for every age. And when I saw it, I thought it was beautiful and intriguing and felt so Jewish, right? What is more Jewish than lifelong reading and learning? Yesterday, we celebrated the holiday of Simchat Torah, which is the holiday in which we celebrate another year of reading through our book of books, the Torah. Um, and it is just so Jewish to want to celebrate and read for our entire lives. And of course, we had to do it for 120 years because we wish one another Ademea um, Vesrim to 120. May we all live and read for 120 years and learn all of that for all of that time. Um, so I'm going to pass the microphone along to Naomi Firestone Teeter from the Jewish Book Council, and then we will get started from there with our panelists. So Naomi, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Rachel. I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you all today on behalf of Jewish Book Council. We're thrilled to present this event in partnership with our friends at My Jewish Learning. All of, all of you with us today know the transformative power of a great book. They provide entertainment, are a source of inspiration and comfort, and have the ability to put... I don't see where to cast your mic phone, so I'm trying. Um, <laughs> um, are a source of inspiration and comfort and have the ability to push us out of our comfort zone and provide new ways for us to think about ourselves and the world in which we live. Books are a critical access point for understanding Jewish life, identity, culture, and history, and are written by storytellers, thinkers, and scholars. They are essential, and we are enriched by their words and ideas. At Jewish Book Council, we're dedicated to ensuring that Jewish books have a platform. We encourage their publication, support authors in finding their audience, and create discovery tools for readers looking for their next great read. Our mission at Jewish Book Council is to educate, enrich, and strengthen the community through Jewish literature. Each year, JBC reaches more than half a million readers with weekly reviews and essays, arranges 1,400 Jewish literary programs, publishes the literary journal Paper Brigade, don't forget to order the new issue, it's coming out next month, presents the National Jewish Book Awards, and provides discussion resources to over 2,000 book clubs, among other activities. I hope you'll visit our website and learn more about our programs and resources and consider becoming a member to support JBC's continued initiatives. Before we begin officially today's program, I'd like to very quickly thank Thea Weaseltier, Director of Strategic Projects and Public Programs for 70 Faces Media, for all of her support to make this event possible. And also, and most especially, Evie Sapphire Bernstein, JBC's program director who put together today's incredible lineup and managed the many logistics to make this program a success. And with that, I am very pleased to turn the program over to today's moderator, Ben Harris, managing editor of My Jewish Learning. Thank you so much and take it away, Ben. Thank you, Naomi. It's good to be here with you all. Uh, I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, I am super excited for uh, this conversation. We have a truly amazing group of Jewish writers with us, uh, all of whom have books included uh, on our list of 120 books uh, for every Jewish age, 120 Jewish books for every age. Uh, I want to take a moment uh, just as we start to introduce them to you. Um, please uh, give a little wave when I call out your name, uh, beginning with Eric Kimmel. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us. Uh, Eric is the author of over 150 books for children, including the classics uh, Anansi and the Moss Covered Rock, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, and Herschel and the Hanukkah Goblins, a 1990 Caldecott Award honor book. Uh, I will say parenthetically, I recently had the privilege of editing a, an essay for my Jewish learning uh, inspired by that book. I think we'll, we'll try to drop a link to that uh, in the chat box uh, for you folks to check out. Uh, Eric is the five-time winner of the National Jewish Book Award uh, and has been awarded the Sydney Taylor Lifetime Achievement Award by the Association of Jewish Libraries. Thanks for being with us uh, today, Eric. Pleasure. Uh, 
We also have um, on our panel today, uh, Naomi Reagan, uh, a best-selling author, playwright, and journalist. Her books include Jephthah's Daughter uh, and her most recent book, An Observant Wife, both of which touch on the inner lives of religious women. Uh, she is also a columnist for the Jerusalem Post. Naomi, thanks for being with us today. Was. <laughs> oh, excuse me, was a columnist. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, Next up, uh, Peter Cole uh, is a poet, translator, and scholar whose works include the poetry of Kabbalah, mystical verse from the Jewish tradition, and Sacred Trash, what a title, The Lost and Found World of the Cairo Geniza. He is a senior lecturer in Judaic Studies and Comparative Literature at Yale and a past winner of the National Jewish Book Award for Poetry and the American Library Association's Brody Medal for Jewish Book of the Year. Thank you for joining us today, Peter. Uh, you are muted. Just remember for next time. <laughs> Let me just say that that's the sacred trash is also written with my wife, Adina Hoffman, who's watching in the next room. So uh. wonderful. Welcome, Adina. Good to have you here as well. Uh, and last but not least is Ilana Kershan, a writer and translator based in Jerusalem. Her 2017 book, If All the Seas Were Ink, uh, is a memoir of her seven and a half years study of the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, and was the recipient of the Sammy Rohr Prize and the Sophie Brody Medal, uh, and was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. Um, thank you for joining us, Ilana. Thank you to all of us. Um, great to have you with us today. So the impetus for our conversation today, uh, as Rachel noted, is My Jewish Learnings recently published 120 Jewish books for every age. Um, we will, I think, drop a link to that if we haven't already in the chat. Um, Lists of this, as we know, are well-established features of the modern media landscape. There is a reason listicle is now part of our cultural lexicon. Uh, many of these works, as we know, are just good fun, um, like Time Out Israel's uh, recent list of things that only make sense to Israelis, or the 25 signs that you drink too much wine. Uh, we even have listicles now about listicles, um, like Vice's listicle about the shirt 13 shittiest BuzzFeed listicles. Um, but many of these are at least superficially more high-minded, uh, like the yearly roundups of the best music and film, books and TV shows. Uh, we have lists based on objective data, like the bestseller lists and the Forbes 400, and many more highly debatable ones, uh, like the best holiday gifts for your spouse or Time Magazine's annual list of the year's most influential people. The New York Times now regularly offers up lists of the five key takeaways from a given news event. Uh, in the Jewish media world, we are not immune to any of this. Uh, there's the Forward 50 and the Jewish Week's 36 to Watch, formerly known as 36 under 36. There's tablets, lists of the most Jewish foods and most Jewish films. Uh, and for a couple of years, we even had the list of the year's sexiest rabbis. Um, clearly, these are fun to read and probably fun to make as okay. well. Um, but I want to suggest that part of the reason we make these lists is because they can ignite uh, conversation. And that is what we are going to try to do today. Um, so I want to begin uh, by inviting our panelists to weigh in on the My Jewish Learning List. Uh, what did we really get right here? What did we get wrong? What books were perfectly placed? Uh, and which did we err in failing to include? Uh, and I will also say, um, before I invite our panelists to weigh in on this, um, I also want to invite our um, audience to do so as well. Um, the chat is open, um, so we would love to hear from you as well. Uh, what parts of the lists you like, what part did you not like so much, um, what did we overlook, um, please do uh, share with us your thoughts as well, and we'll try to surface some of those as time allows. Um, but Eric, why don't we begin with you? Um, okay. Give us give us a kick on this list, if you would. <laughs> okay, I think you start with me, because I'm the oldest. <laughs> I've been yeah. around the longest. Um, I look upon a list as a door, not a box. So these are excellent books to uh, read and enjoy and to start with on uh, your journey into Jewish books and Jewish literature. Is this the, uh, the hierarchy of books that everybody should read? No, not necessarily. These are suggestions. I've sat on these committees and some of them are compromises. Uh, with all authors, some of my best books never got on any lists. They never won any awards. A lot of them never even got into print. So I see it as the first step on uh, finding good books. What are the titles you want to know? What are the names of authors? What else has this person done? Uh, got another book on this subject. 
And I think that's really the only way to look at it because a list is a list. We put it together and uh, we've got some good choices. We've got some bad choices. We have some books that will be in print for 100 years. We have some books that will be forgotten within 10 or 20. Um, anyway, that's, my, that's how I take it. That's how I look upon it. And uh, I see them as an invitation rather than something that's locked in stone. Uh, these are the best. These are the medal winners. These are, that, that phrase I despise, G-O-A-T, greatest of all times. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. Time moves on. Read a anything, good anything, story. <laughs> anything you would have uh, you would have added, Eric, that we neglected to, besides all of your other books, of course. I mean, Oh, gosh, I could be here for a long time. <laughs> well, I mean, just to throw something out, um, I think the list is a uh, weak on current uh, Israeli writers. I think it's weak on uh, modern Israel. For some reason, I think the American Jewish community leans very heavy towards Holocaust stuff and avoids uh, modern Israel, which I think is a big mistake. Frankly, I'm getting tired of Holocaust literature. There's plenty of it and uh, enough murder and death. We have moved on. And we've moved on in some stunning, miraculous ways, and I think that deserves credit. I think a lot of them Israeli Jews, a lot of modern American Jews seem to have this complex about Israel. Oh, Israel is bad. Well, you're falling for propaganda then. Israel is something to be tremendously proud of. And uh, as an American Jew, my heart lifts up when I go to Israel, even though I know I'm a foreigner there and I can't speak the language very well. Um, that's what I see as the, the weak, a weak link. And another weak link I see, and not necessarily weak links, these are just other people's choices, things that I would have put in, would have been some different books by Philip Roth and Herman Woke, uh, Marjorie Morningstar, which is a book that just glows in my memory. I mean, this is what it was like to be a Jewish girl growing up in that era, and the pressures and the challenges that were on you. And a book that everybody says, oh, Yashanda is a Portnoy's Complaint. Philip Roth. Philip Roth is a brilliant writer, but you want to know what it was like to be a young Jewish man in that era? Portnoy's complaint. He, ha he has it all there. Um, I guess I was a bad boy in uh, in literature because Herschel and the Hanukkah Goblins would never have been published if I had to depend on Jewish editors. It was published by Holiday House, completely non-Jewish uh, house. Nobody with there was... Uh, you know, was really aware of the, uh, oh, the tensions within the Jewish community. The reaction I got when that book first came out was, oh, it's too scary. Well, you know, I grew up as a kid with my old boba from Galicia, and she told me scary stories, and I loved them, and kids love a scary story with a good ending. Um, I tend to think, maybe it's because of the way I grew up, uh, parents and grown-ups are the enemy. And children's books you have to when you write children's books you got to get over the parents you got to get over the teachers to get to the kid you can reach the kid you've got a friend for life as i often said to my grandson uh why do grandparents and grandchildren get along so well they have a common enemy i think that's why the jewish writers who write edgy stuff get along so well with jewish kids we have a common enemy too the establishment and the grown-ups uh, <laughs> I'm old, but I'm not a grown-up. I never grew up. I'm 10. Well, I've talked long enough. Let's open it up to somebody else. Thanks, Eric. I, I saw as you were talking that uh, our editor, Rachel, was taking notes. So maybe we'll uh, we'll have a new lesson in the works. With <laughs> a, little not less Holocaust, <laughs> a little less Holocaust, a little more Israeli writers. I'm curious. We have two writers here who live in Israel. I'm curious to throw it over to one of you. Um, not enough Israeli writers. Anything else that we uh, we might have missed on this? Are you addressing this to both of us? To one Alice, of us? whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> um, well, I, I just feel that um, it's not a question of Israeli writers versus American writers. I was really confused, and I love book lists. I, I'm a very big aficionado of book lists because I always um, am able to find some hidden jewel that I didn't hear about, and I've read many wonderful books from, you know, uh, searching at one o'clock in the morning on com my computer for a list of 100 books you have to read before you die. You have no idea how many wonderful books were on that list. Um, but I was confused because this is supposed to be 120 Jewish books for every, um, for every age, and I look at this list and 
I, I try to understand what constitutes a Jewish book. Is it because the author is Jewish? Is it because, um, you know, uh, it deals with Jewish material? Um, or because there are books on this list um, that have absolutely nothing to do with Judaism. You know, you have the BCs in, you have um, Susan Sontag's um, Against Interpretation, you have Dr. Rav's Ragtime. What in heaven's name does that have to do with Jews? Or Tony Kushner's Angels in America, or Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. And, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem putting it on this list, but um, when I look at the list that I would have put on Jewish books, uh, number one on this list would be the Tanakh. That would be the uh, most Jewish book you could put on this list. And I highly recommend the new edition that's um, um, the Madriman Tanakh with the um, English translation from Rabbi Sachs, which is a masterpiece. And I am reading it cover to cover. And I don't think there's absolutely anything that you could read that's more of a Jewish book than the Tanakh. And, and then you have, you know, uh, authors, Jewish authors, uh, you know, kol HaKavod to, or, or more power to Arthur Miller. But what about Chaim Grade? What about my mother's uh, Sabbath? Uh, what about, you know, um, Faith in the Holocaust by Eliezer Berkowitz? What about Donna Grassi and the House of Nasi by Cecil Roth? Or, um, if we're talking about children's books, what about Carp in the Bathtub by Barbara Cohen? Yeah. Or one of my favorites is The Fanatic by Mayor Levine, which I think you can't find a more Jewish book than, than that book. That's an amazing book, and based, of course, on a, on a true story. Uh, my own personal, um, I would say, uh, book that led me to different life-changing decisions would be the book while six million died by arthur um morris and you know that was the book that made me decide to make aliyah you know uh how america behaved during the holocaust so that, i think that's a seminal book so i think what what i have here is a, a certain um lack of understanding of what was the the um, criteria for for a book to make this list was it what was the Jewish part of the Jewish books for every age and that's what I'm I really would like some direction on that and I'd like to try to understand it well my big takeaway from hearing you talk Naomi is that I have a lot more reading to do um, and a lot more books that have uh, that have escaped me um, but maybe we'll we'll turn it over to Peter and Ilana for a moment for their thoughts on the list so it didn't it didn't occur to me that there was any lack of um, or tension between Israeli and diaspora writers that didn't didn't really bother me at all um, and I tend to as you were saying Ben I tend to look at these lists as primarily fun. And so all of Nomi's questions uh, and Eric's uh, doubts are, are, are you know, well placed, but I, I tend not to take it quite as seriously as that. And maybe that has to do with my initial contact with lists as a child in the early 60s um, on a bus, school bus, or in a car going to Yavna Academy in Patterson, New Jersey. And mo mo was foremost on my mind at different points of the year, especially this kind of towards the end of the year, was um, WABC Radio, Cousin Brucey, and the list of the voting for the top 10 or the top, you know, 100 songs of the year. And nothing mattered more to me than getting my guys and my Freddie and the Dreamers and a particular Beatles song. And I would just, you know, that, that would take over my life and I would wait for the results and then analyze the results. And that's kind of my approach to all lists, including the New York Times, you know, top 100 lists and all those things, and including all the big book prizes and some of them that I've been lucky enough to win. So, you know, with, with a grain of salt, first of all. Um, in terms of, and I agree, I don't remember, was it Eric who said it, but the, yeah, the Roth really stands out as that, that choice of the Roth is, is just bizarre. Uh, maybe because it's less offensive, although 
nothing that he writes is black, you know, is missing. <laughs> doesn't offend in some way. But Portnoy's Complaint and Sabbath Theater, which to my mind is one of the great dark masterpieces of American literature, period, and certainly Jewish writing. It's unbearable. Right? It just, it's too much. But the writing, the prose, and the, the kind of courage that's behind that book is uh, unparalleled. Um, but let me, because I'm a poet and, uh, and a translator, I want to uh, speak out for the, um, what could be interpreted as a dearth of poetry on the list. On the other hand, you've been very sneaky. You smuggled in three anthologies that contain hundreds of poets, none of them mentioned by name, none of them mentioned by, by anything. But So you've got um, the Humash and Alter's translation, although most of the poetry is elsewhere in the Bible. You've got uh, Carmi's anthology, The Penguin Book of Hebrew Verse, which is a very, very important book, although in prose, it actually translates to prose, but covers an enormous range of poets and really exquisitely chosen. And, and My Dream of the Poem. Um, so what I wanted to do was speak up for a, and then the two individual poets on the list are Yehuda Amichai, nobody will argue with Amichai, although some of my friends would argue with Amichai, but um, maybe the book that you chose, maybe he has, maybe there are better, fuller, more representative books than that one. Um, but, and the other one is Emma Lazarus, who I adore, but who is primarily known for one poem on the Statue of Liberty. She's a very complicated, interesting, half Ashkenazi, half Sephardic figure. I mean, I teach her, I, I love her essays, I love everything about her, but I'm not sure that if there's gonna be two individual poets, she should be one of them. And, but so the one poet I wanted to single out uh, as being, first of all, as being left off is that I, I brought a little in books to show and tell, is um, Paul Ceylon. And in this particular translation by Michael Hamburger, um, Ceylon, a Holocaust survivor, and I agree with Eric totally about the overrepresentation of the Holocaust. But the thing about Ceylon is he's kind of the ultimate post-Holocaust poet who is so who so totally inhabits his moment that he transcends it and really writes through or for all of Jewish literary and ritual and existential history. Uh, he's a great, great, unbearable vulnerable, beautiful, kind of awful and raw poet. Um, and so I wanted, I thought that was a book, um, just A, because of the position of the Holocaust in, in Jewish thought, but B, because of sheer beauty. I know all of Jewish, Jewish poetry is, is generally a kind of under-recognized thing in the, in the, when we talk about the literature of the Jews. When you think about the entire history of the Jews or of Judaism, or beginning with pre-Judaism of the Bible, from the Song of the Sea or even earlier poems on, right? Poems, piyutim, they run up through the spinal cord of Jewish ritual history, to summer camp, to lechadodi, to Friday night, to everything, everything, right? Poetry is there in this almost subliminal way. We just take it for granted because we just sing these songs that we know. Um, but so I think that that could have been could have been represented a little more. And um, no, I've got other things to say. But uh, oh, I, yes, there was a, one other thing I wanted to say because we're all getting very highbrow. One of my favorite Jewish books and Jewish writers in the world, and possibly I've mentioned my wife Adina Hoffman, but possibly the book that has made our marriage is uh, well, Audia Rodin. In her book of Jewish food, the book of Jewish food uh, is a total, I mean, she's a marvelous, marvelous writer, first of all, a kind of cultural historian and someone whose understanding of food and the place of food in She's most known for a book called the um, Book of Middle Eastern Food, which is Apart from the poems of Constantine Kavafis, the Greek poet, the first book I bought my wife, um, these are just the Jerusalem. Oh, look. You can see some of them are 
not in Great Britain. <laughs> uh, then there's the copies I have that we have in, Jeru in, in New Haven. In terms of representing Sephardic Judaism, this book is also, I think, just a total treasure. Beautiful, Peter. Thank you, Ilana. Um, so I was I was very intrigued by the notion of a Jewish book for every age. Um, it seemed to me like a, a very Jewish notion that there's something we read um, at every stage of our lives. It reminded me of a of the Mishnah in Pir Kavot, where the rabbis say that when you're five, you begin you're to begin learning Torah. When you're ten, you begin learning Mishnah. When you're 15, you begin learning Talmud, etc. Um, it seems like a, a very Jewish idea that there are books appropriate for every age, and, and age itself is, is viewed as an opportunity to grow in wisdom. Um, so I, I love the way the list reflected that. Um, on the other hand, though, I, I found myself reading through this list, and the, the the children's books seem to go by so quickly. I, I, I had only begun scanning the list, and all of a sudden, we were at bar mitzvah and I said to myself, what, like, that's it. We get, you know, 12, 13 books. Um, and I, I was thinking about how, you know, I, even just for myself, you know, I thought, you know, well, I, it seemed to me like, a, you know, time, time goes by so much slower when you're younger. Um, and, and children's books are, are so much shorter and, and we read so many of them. So that, that, you know, I, I turned from 41 to 42 in what seemed like the blink of an eye. And, and during that time, my daughter turned three, then, you know, oh, when am I going to be three and one quarter? When, when, and when am I going to be three and a half? You know, so, so that I felt like I needed more children's books. Um, I felt that was really missing. Um, some of the books that came to mind, um, books that seemed so canonical because they were so important in my own childhood, um, the All the Kind Family series. I know we mentioned the Sydney Taylor Award before, but of course, name for it, for the author of that series. Um, um, Meshka the Kvetch, um, Chana's Shabbat Dress, The Adventures of Katantan, Molly's Pilgrim, um, were some of the books that, um, also The Carp in the Bathtub, I think Naomi yes. Reagan mentioned, yes. um, also for okay. me was very canonical, <laughs> could not re imagine my childhood without that book. Um, um, so those, those books felt very missing um, for me, given how formative they were um, in my own, my own reading life as a child. Um, um, and in terms of adult books, I, I don't know, I still think in terms of children's and adult literature, um, books that I was really missing because they were so important for me um, as a reader and, and books that really felt like they captured something fundamental to a way of being Jewish in the world. Um, I was missing um, Marmani by Aleph Bet Yoshua, feels like such an important book. Um, all of Chaim Grata's books, I would have put anything on. Um, um, also, that raised the question for me of, you know, there was a book about the world of the Lithuanian yeshivot, but it was a nonfiction book. And I, and that sort of raised the question for me of what, what, as, what, what aspects of the Jewish experience are in, represented on the list in fiction and what are represented in nonfiction and, and what guided that choice I thought was very interesting. Um, um, Grace Paley, um, Sharansky's Fear No Evil. I couldn't believe that wasn't on the list. Um, um, I don't know, Aaron Lansky's book about, about Yiddish books um, as a book lover. That book was very, very, um, very important to me. Um, and I also um, um, noticed um, also a dearth of, uh, of Israeli writers and particularly Israeli women writers, aside from Orly Kestel Bloom, um, Batya Gore, Shulamit Lapid, Yael Hadaya. I don't know. I just thought of, um, I think very often um, when people think of Israeli literature, for some reason, men seem to be much more represented. Um, so, uh, so I, I felt that, um, that absence, um, and, uh, and what else? I also, um, you know, it didn't bother me, you know, to, you know, the fact that, okay, so the list does not include, you know, the, the, the earliest books of, of Jewish literature, Tanakh, Mishnah, fine. But I think in a way, in a way, I think all of those works are represented because, um, I view all Jewish literature as cumulative. Um, you can't, every Jewish book seems to be somehow in dialogue, somehow echoing, um, resonating with Jewish books that came before. Um, and this was an idea that first came, I, I realized this first when I was reading, I don't even remember which one, but some novel by Dara Horn where somewhere in the book she writes, um, there was a line and the two of them walked off together. And immediately I thought, 
that's the akeda, you know, and it's like, all of a sudden I realized, you know, you, there are certain sentences you can't write without you're echoing something else, right? And, and you know, uh, it, it's already inherent in the Tanakh. You read later books of the Tanakh and you hear echoes of earlier books of the Tanakh and the Tanakh itself is a later books of the Tanakh or, or Midrashim and earlier books of the Tanakh. But in a way, I think that's true of all Jewish literature. All Jewish literature is 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 commentary on on literature that came before. Um, so so I, I felt in a way that 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 maybe maybe the fact that there were a lot of more modern works um, maybe didn't bother me so much because I felt like those works contained within them um, that, that the core of earlier works. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, while I did like the idea of a Jewish book for every age, it struck me that it's also, I, I, I wanted to see certain periods in Jewish history represented. Um, and I started to think about, well, what would it look like instead of writing a Jewish book for every age in the individual's life to think of a Jewish book for every, I don't know, every, I don't know how one would do it, decade in Jewish history, century in Jewish history, you know, what would it be like to have, you know, I don't know, to say, okay, um, I, I don't know how one would do it, like Tilly Olson for the 30s and 40s and 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 Marjorie Morningstar for the 50s. I don't know. You go on. You know, I don't know. Something different ways of, of organizing lists, the list by age. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I appreciate you servicing the uh, the question of, of the age aspect of this list, because that's obviously the the shtick that we uh, chose to adopt. I, I don't mean that in a critical way, shtick in the best possible way. Um, but uh, the thing that I wanted to put forth to you folks for the next round is, is about that question of, of age. Uh, and I'm curious, um, well, twofold, really. Uh, uh, on the one hand, um, each of you were on this list at a particular age, and I'm wondering if... Uh, how you feel about where you where you wound up in terms of the age appropriateness and Eric is specifically with you who writes books that are described as books for children and yet as as is evidenced by the essay that I mentioned at the outset. Um, clearly a lot of adults also really um, love your books uh, so i'm curious on the one hand how you all felt about where, about the ages to which we pegged you, um, but also I'm wondering if you can share and, and, a, and a little bit has come out of in this conversation already um, about books in your own lives um, that touched you at particular moments at particular ages that you you associate um, with having been at a particular moment of your life when it was really impactful for you. Um, so feel free to respond to, to one or both of those. Um, and uh, yeah, whoever wants to go first, the floor is open. <laughs> I'll jump in. I'm at the bottom the beginning <laughs> of the list with the children's books. Um, I think part of what's most important about children's books, especially in my own writing, is recovering the sense of childhood and wonder. There's a mistake uh, among a lot of people who look and criticize, write or criticize children's books, especially these days, that the book has to have a message. The book is going to teach children something. It's going to show children something. It's going to make them believe something. Well, that's the grown-up talking to the kid, and that's the way I grew up, and I had my fill of it. Uh, my escape was my uh, old country grandma, who didn't bother to learn to speak English, who was a very subversive person in the house. She adored the Kaisers. She had a, a postcards of Kaiser Wilhelm and Kaiser Franz Josef on her mantle. Uh, she never bothered to learn English, though she spoke four or five languages. She didn't like the sound of it. She th thought it sounded like dogs barking. Um, she lived in a world of evil spirits, of miracles. She told lots of stories. She was a wonderful storyteller. None of the stories ended with, and they lived happily ever after. They usually were about kids who didn't listen to grandma and ended up in a bad way. Excuse me, my watch is going off. Apple watches get to be annoying. <laughs> um, so I spent hours and hours with her because she grew up in our house and I learned what stories were. And when you write for children, you're going back to something older than books. You're going back to the told story. One of the uh, most seminal experiences I had as a writer was being a storyteller in the parks in the summer. And kids would come, and if you had a good story, they'd listen to you. And if they didn't like the story, they'd get up in the middle and leave. Sometimes they'd offer you a comment. You stink. This is boring. And that's how you learn to tell a tale. And the only thing that's important is the tale. 
The tail isn't necessarily for any specific group. It's for whatever child who wants to plug into the tail. And the greatest children's books are the books you can plug into at any age. You read Winnie the Pooh when you're six or you have it read to you. And then you read it when you're 36 or when you're 66 and you realize just how funny a book it is. There's always something to be found. Same thing with Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and so may Wind in the Willow, so many other great children's classics in English. I was pleased to see that you had one of my childhood favorites on the list, The Wise Men of Helm. Uh, which is a book I read when I was in the third grade and just adored. It made me laugh and laugh. And it was especially important because it was a Jewish book. This is about me. This is about my grandma. I understand this stuff. This is my book. So looking at a book, it's I don't necessarily put books in categories because you can come to a great book at any age and get something out of it. Uh, it's what you bring to the book rather than what the book is bringing to you. Um, I think I've, I hope, well, I hope that makes sense. This is just off the top of my head. But from a writer, from a children, from someone who writes children's books, the first thing I'd say to writers is tell the story. Tell the story that you would have listened to when you were a child. Don't worry about teaching. Don't worry about preaching. There is no message. There's only the story. The story is all that matters. And if you've told the story well, the children will be able to, der will be able to derive whatever meaning or whatever message there is from it. But it's the story, the story, the story. That's your uh, lodestar in writing for children. I think it's the lodestar for uh, anybody writing for, uh, for any age. Okay, next. Eric, who's next? Well, I'm happy where you put me. Um, I think 27 is a good age to read um, to read that book, Jeff's Daughter. Even though I, I personally would not have chosen, I've written 14 books. I don't think I would have chosen my first book to be on this list. I, I probably would have chosen um, maybe my second, which was um, Sota. Or perhaps I would have chosen uh, the Covenant, which was about um, Americans in Israel who undergo terrorist attack and um, express the struggle for survival that we have in Israel against our enemies. Um, I think maybe I would have chosen one of those, or maybe the Saturday Wife, which was uh, about um, it was a satire on the American Jewish community. And I uh, got it over the head for that one. But um, I thought that was sort of more um, something that people could relate to um, as far as not being an Israeli book, but being an American book in, in that sense. But um, I think when I, when I look over the books that I've read um, that had a, the biggest influence on my life, um, again, I have to start with the Tanakh because um, I, I was not born into a religious family and I decided to become religious. I was sent to an Orthodox Hebrew day school because my mother thought it had better English and math and um, she didn't want me to go to public school. So I, I sort of, um, you know, slept through the Hebrew classes until a certain point. I had a teacher for Tanakh and he was teaching us um, um, Mishpatim, the, the, uh, the laws, and he got to all the laws about the widow and the orphan, and now I was an orphan, my mother was a widow, and the whole emphasis on um, the kindness that you have to show a widow and an orphan, it spoke to me so deeply, and I began to feel that being Jewish was, was a privilege and it was a way of life. And if it could encourage people to be kinder to widows and to orphans, then this was something I was very interested in, um, in getting into um, from my own choice, not from any um, social reason, not from, because my family was pushing me, not because the school was pushing it, because this truly and fundamentally interested me. Um, I think I, 
as an adult um, furthered this with books like um, Herman Wook's This Is My God, which I think should be really, if you ever make up another list, put that book on your list. That book I keep next to my Tanakh. That is one of the most wonderful books ever written about being a Jew. And um, I knew Herman Wook, and um, I think that he was one of our most fabulous writers. And um, you have two of his books on your list. Of course, you can't put um, all of his books on your list. I understand that. But I think that that book deserves to be on everybody's list. And um, also reading Inside Outside, it was very, uh, it was very seminal for me to read about all the things I was experiencing as an American Jew and not feeling at home and and wanting to find a place that was more uh, in line with who I viewed myself as and my true self. And, and not something which was an accident of birth, but a choice. And I think that was one of the reasons I decided to make Aliyah. And, um, I think that uh, when you put a book like Survival in Auschwitz um, for a 17 year old, I think that's a little too young for Survival in Auschwitz. I didn't read Survival in Auschwitz until I was in my 40s or 50s, and even then it was very difficult reading. And um, an excellent book, of course, heartbreaking. But I think for a 17 year old to read that book, um, I think it would be hard. Uh, so I would have put that in a different place on the list. I certainly would have put it on the list, but I wouldn't have put it on the list that young. Thanks, Amy. Peter and Ilana, books that hit you at particular ages that uh, you want to share? Ilana, why don't you go first just to mix it up? Sure. Um, I think that books have to find you at the right moment in life. Um, maybe in a way it's like, it's like, it's like finding a spouse that, you know, you, you can, you can meet the right person at the wrong time and, and they're not the right person if it's the wrong time. Um, a, a book is like that too. Ideally a book comes into your life when you're able to be most receptive to it. Um, and, and the books I, I most love are to some extent, just a product of that accident of, you know, or coincidence of, of when I happened, you know, the fact that I happened to encounter them at the right moment that I, I discovered Henrietta Zold's love letters after a bad breakup or that I read uh, Rebecca Goldstein's The Mind Body Problem when I took my first philosophy class in college or whatever it is, you know, that's, that's happenstance. Um, but it really, it really, um, it really shapes our relationship with a, with a particular book. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, I think that with great literature, um, the more, every time you read a book, um, you discover something different and Eric alluded to this before and um, you know that that a great book is not a book you you read once it's a book that every time you come back to it you discover you discover something else um, you find new ways of connecting I think that's 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 certainly what's what's kept Tanakh so um, so vital and so so relevant um, um, is, is is Midrash the fact that over time we continue to find new ways of building that bridge between between this book of books and 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 the unfolding Jewish experience over time, um, uh, so part of the part of what a list like this does not allow for um, is the the pleasures of rereading and and rediscovering the same book again later in life and discovering that it's a different book because because we're different people, um, yeah. So I would, um, let me start with, I, I was a little perplexed by the link between ages and books throughout the list in, in different ways, but as I say, that's, that's fine. I, um, I could go with that. Um, and then I got to my own books. I have two books on the list uh, along with the one with Adina. And I figured, I wondered, why was the dream of the poem age 58? And then Sacred Trash was age 85. And I thought, oh, that's very Jewish, right? You're just playing with the numbers. Gematria, they're all, the, they're really the same book. Uh, and in fact, we're always writing the same book, whether it's other people's poems or them translating or anything. It's all, it's all, it's all one. Um, so that was, that was kind of, uh, I love the, I don't know if that was intentional, the 58 and 85, um, but I enjoyed it. Um, 
And then I sort of thought a little more about it. Well, maybe the, it's a book, The Dream of the Poem was about medieval Hebrew poetry from Muslim and Christian Spain. And I suppose mathematically through Jewish history, it kind of comes out around there in relationship to 120. And the Geniza book should be later because it's discovery of 19, in the 19th century, discovery of older texts. And so all that made, made a kind of sense. But I, in answer to Ben, the question you, you sent us in advance of, and that some other people have talked about now, I think the age for me that, that, that really hit me hard, the books that had a kind of pivotal, represented some kind of pivotal moment in my um, reading and writerly experience. It really did change the way I think about being a Jew, being a Jewish writer, um, occurred between the ages of, let's say, 22 and 24. So just coming out of college, being sort of freed from, I didn't go to graduate school, being freed from institutional, sort of the, the support of an institution, and really having to figure out everything on your own, everything. And that's also the time I first came to Jerusalem uh, in an intensive way for a year when I was 23, 23 and a half, something like that. And a couple of the books that, that, and also because I teach half the year at Yale, and so I have very, very, and I, I love to teach, I consider an essential part of my Jewish being, uh, whether I'm teaching Jewish subjects or not, um, but I'm teaching students that age often. And the hunger is unbelievable. I mean, and especially in the Jewish students, and I get all kinds of Jewish students, including non-Jewish students who are fascinated by Jewish students. I consider them Jewish students. Um, so there's something very vulnerable and open and intellectually powerful and kind of tender and muscular about um, sort of the reading experience at that age. And that's when I discovered Ceylon, a friend get, just handed it to me. Um, and then another book that a friend handed to me was um, The Book of Questions by Edmund Jabez, an Egyptian Jewish writer who ended up after the Suez crisis, moving to, um, to Paris and living uh, the rest of his adult life there. I have a very ambivalent relationship to his writings, but man, they totally derailed me. They just knocked my socks off and made me think completely. They made a kind of Jewish writing that I didn't entertain for myself as being possible, possible. So it, it opened something for me, it opened a door in, in a major way. And, and that hit me at that age. And I don't know, because, because of that and American objectivist poets like Charles Reznikov and Louis Lukowski, who probably are not familiar to some people, I see some people in the audience, I know they'll be familiar to, but less so to, to a lot. Maybe Charles Reznikov, because he worked on the Nora Journal and things like that. But those are the poets that I discovered in that critical period. And, and they just stay with me. And, and I feel when I teach and students kind of come looking for something, and I teach all of this stuff also, I feel a really powerful obligation to respect their hunger and give them something really substantive and serious and, and maybe difficult and challenging. And, and they respond, they really do respond. So that's the age I would speak. And, and also, I want to just thank everyone who has chimed in in the chat as well um, with this steady stream of, of books. I've had a, an opportunity to jot down a couple of titles just as we're talking of things that uh, probably need to be on my reading list as well. So thank you for sharing all of those. Uh, and please do keep them coming. We only have about 10 minutes left, um, but I wanted to see if we could turn back to uh, a point that actually Eric made right at the outset about uh, the value of lists in general, uh, and to take the MJL list out of the hot seat for just a moment and uh, to talk about whether or not these uh, lists in general um, are good things for us media types to be doing. Um, I think we think of them as services to readers um, to let them know what we think they ought to be looking at. Um, but there's also an argument out there that um, they are subjective judgments of what's in, what's out. Uh, and a lot of good things are obviously overlooked, as uh, you've mentioned, uh, all of the panelists, uh, a couple of things that we have we have neglected to include as well. So I'm curious just in general, um, whether or not this uh, 
trend, if we can even call it that, I don't know if that's even the right word for it, but they seem to be ubiquitous today uh, of, of ranking and including and listing and so on, um, whether this is actually a good thing that we should be engaging in. Um, Ilana, do you want to jump in on this one first? Sure. Um, I think, you know, I, I think that with, um, with, with Jewish books, maybe with all books, but for me, it's it's I, I feel it most with Jewish literature that the, the more you read, the, the more you realize how much more you want to read and have to read, the more you learn, the more you realize how much more you have to learn um, and want to learn. And in that sense, I agree with with Eric's idea of, of the, a list is a door that, you know, you read one book and then you have to read every book cited in all the footnotes in that book because suddenly it's now opened this network of, of tunnels into a world, into all sorts of worlds that you want to inhabit. Um, so uh, so I, I like the idea, you know, uh, every one of these authors reminded me of, every one of the authors on the list reminded me of all the other books by that author that I haven't read and still want to read. Um, so uh, so I think that, that lists provide a valuable service in that they, uh, they, they open our eyes to, 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 to what, how we want to spend the rest of our 120 minus minus X years of life. Um, anytime I, I'm feeling down or or upset or or anytime, I, I don't know. I, I go through periods where you know things seem futile. I I go into a library and nothing nothing is more uplifting for me and inspiring for me than walking into a library and looking around at all the books I still want to read and and nothing is more. Um, makes me more embracing of, of life than, than looking at all the books I have yet to read. So in that sense, I found this list um, very inspiring and very uplifting. So thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Naomi, I saw you nodding along there. Do you want to jump in on that too? <laughs> I think that, you know, when you're a writer and you write a book, you're, you're filling it with your own passions. And when you're a reader and you're reading a book, you you're entering into the passions of the creator of that work. And that is a way to expand your horizons, your universe, make your heart larger, your mind larger. And so I think when you go into a list that's been created of books, what you're actually doing is going into the passions of the person who created that list. And um, the list maker's passions, um, whether or not you agree with everything on the list, it, it, to me, it's certain, it, it is just as interesting as, as going into a book and, and seeing the passions of the writer. So you, you take a look at the, um, you know, 100 books to read before you die, or, you know, 120 Jewish books, or um, all of the many lists that are out there, and you see the passion of the people who created those lists. And if you go into those lists and, and you can find a treasure, then you have them to thank. And you have that person that you never met who created that list. You have them to thank for opening up your heart, opening up your mind, expanding your horizons. So I love lists and I love lists the same way I love the books um, because it's a way of um, connecting with someone else and someone else's viewpoint and, and someone else's loves and hates. So keep creating those lists. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. And uh, we will. And also the list makers passions sounds like it should be the title of its own book. Um, <laughs> we got about five minutes left. Peter, Eric, value of lists. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Eric. No, you go ahead. I started off. Um, so I think maybe the two best things about lists are when you find yourself on them. And then the second thing is the conversations that they start like, like this one. I think those, those are the, you know, the, the two obvious, uh, uh, thrills and, and sort of, uh, clear, clear, uh, clear pleasures. Um, there's a danger also that's not just the kind of the hierarchies and the canons and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that from a writerly point of view, but also from, I think, from a Jewish readerly point of view, lists are basically about consensus or about the people who make the list. And most lists that we tend to, to read in prominent places tend to be 
made by people who we who the people in charge tend to think reflect a consensus at some level. And that's a pretty dangerous thing for a writer. Right? I mean, Eric, you talked about that. Like, don't don't listen to anybody who tells you what the story should be. You know, same thing with poetry. Like, yeah, learn from the people you respect and listen to them and fight with them and disagree with them and all that. And 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 we'll listen hard. But um, writers don't become the, I don't know, the writers I've that have been most important to me. And this writer has been important to me. Um, you become the writer you become by, you pay attention to the consensus, but you do not let it determine where you go and what you pay attention to. And what you pay attention to, and it's really the hardest thing I think for readers in general out there as adults and then also as younger people is to listen to yourself as a reader and a responder. No. I don't really respond to that. Yes, that thing that nobody else is paying any attention to, that means the world to me, even if it makes me marginal and somewhat freakish. And that's, a, that's something I think is really hard, especially today because of the information flood I see it with students. They're told, people are told so from every direction what's good and what's popular and, and what you need to do to become popular and become good. And that, so that's that's the danger there with Liz. I want to speak up just for one more book, last thing I say, um, which didn't make it on the list because it's a it's a it's a list in itself. It's a kind of anthology. But this is a book called Contemporary Jewish Religious Thought. I wonder how many people know about it. It was edited by one of my literary and Jewish heroes, Arthur Cohen, and co-edited by Paul Mendes Floor. And this is a collection of just I think it was published in the late 80s or mid 80s. Phenomenal essays on a whole range of topics, time and music and messianism and all the obvious Jewish things and less obvious Jewish things. And it says on the top of major achievement, New York Times book review. I've recommended this to, I don't know, hundreds of people. I have never had anybody recommend it to me. And it's, uh, I, it went into a second printing. I don't know if it's still in print, but I'm going to recommend it here to this vast audience. Thanks, Peter. Uh, and just we have only a couple minutes, but I wanted to let Eric get the last word since he started us off down this path. OK, I'll jump in real quick. Um, wonderful comments from everybody. But to me, a list is like coming to a city in another country for the first time and you have your Rick Steves guide with you mm -hmm. and it lists some places you'd like to go and see. And as you walk around, you see places you'd like to come back to, places you'd like to visit, places you'd like to linger. And I think that's the importance of a list. It's a, do as I said before, it's a door, it's a guide, there's some suggestions. From a writer's point of view, don't take a list too seriously because it doesn't mean whether you're a good writer or a bad writer. I didn't make the list. I must be a failure. I've run into that a lot of times from people. Um, some of the greatest writers, the greatest creative people uh, in uh, our world have thought of themselves as failures, died as failures. Look at Van Gogh. Look at Herman Melville. Scott Fitzgerald thought he was washed up. Um, all you can do is be true to yourself and write out of your heart. And if it makes a list, fine. And if it doesn't, that's also fine. As long as it finds the heart of somebody somewhere who says, that was a pretty good book. You did your job. And more than that, you can't do. Thanks, Eric. And I hope this uh, conversation and this list that we produced also finds its way into someone else's heart as well. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, uh, Naomi. Reagan and Ilana Kershan, Peter Cole and Eric Kimmel, thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Jewish Book Council for partnering with us on this event. And of course, uh, thank you all for joining us today. There is a recording that we will get out. Um, and please do come see us again. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. So long.